This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today has a topic that I think all of us want to know something about. Why we die. Subtitle, The New Science of Aging and the Quest for Immortality. My guest today is Vinky Ramakrishnan. He has a Nobel Prize in chemistry under his belt. So he has some wisdom. He has some insights. He has some knowledge about where we go today. Look, there's a lot of issues here. Do we just live for a long time? Or do we want to have a healthy long time? Should we live forever? Many topics in this conversation. And I think, look, there is no doubt. We all want to know, why do we age? How do we age? Can we retard the aging process? Can we slow it down? Can we do anything? My guest today has some insights. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Vinky Ramakrishnan. I've had several authors, academics on this podcast, go roughly into the topic where you have gone. I think most of the other authors are really talking about how we might get to this extended life and what we can do and what might happen. I think you look at it, that's part of where you go, but it's a bigger issue. The lead off question I want to ask is when you're bringing up this particular topic, how do you like to start assuming you're in front of a large, diverse audience? How do you even like to bring this topic up? Well, the question of aging and death is an age old question. People have wondered ever since we've been humans, why do we have to die? And I point out early in the book that probably we're the only species that's aware of our own mortality. Other animals know that one of their kind has died. They even mourn them. But we're the only people from very early childhood, we come to this realization that we have a time limit on us. And we try to suppress it. We live with it. We try not to brood about it, but it's there in our consciousness. And it's driven a lot of human culture and religion and all kinds of things. They're all about how to deal with this inevitable fact. I also started wondering, why is it that we have to die? Why can't skin replaces itself every couple of years and yet various organs do? Some slower heart or brain don't replace themselves much. But why is it that we have to die at all? And what is the biology? And then you also look at various life forms and various species exist from days or weeks to hundreds of years. It led me to the question of where is the field now? And I can tell you a lot of people who are in the aging field, they have skin in the game. You know, many of these aging researchers, they're associated with companies or they have a very established position. And I'm a molecular biologist who's very close to the biology of the field. For example, my field of protein synthesis, how the body makes proteins using our genetic information, that's very, very closely related to many of the processes of aging. I thought somebody like me could take a hard look at what is going on, especially in the view of the fact that the technology of biology is changing dramatically. The things we're able to do now, it is frankly quite amazing. We're at a crossroads. We might be able to make progress on slowing down this process. Some people think you could even maybe put it off indefinitely. I'm not one of those, at least not in the near future. So I thought it'd be a good time to take a hard look at the field, trying to be free of the hype, what I call excessive enthusiasm. Let me keep you at the one thing you said there for a moment. You mentioned that us humans, homo sapiens, having this knowledge that we have a time limit. I'll share with you that I'm in my 50s and I had a great grandmother get to 101. I had a grandmother get to 100. I had another grandmother get to 94. And I don't know if this is rational, but I just keep assuming that I have the chance to get to these ripe old ages. 
I've not really thought about the time limit myself, but the point that I want to bring up with you is I've noticed much younger people, much younger people in my life, especially women, I'm hearing even in their 20s and 30s, they're talking about their time limit, which surprises me. I'm not just talking babies. I'm talking more just their end of life. So it's interesting how different people will come to the time limit thought process. Oh, absolutely. I think also I've cited a paper which shows that we have evolved to think of death as something that happens to other people. We tend not to think of it as something that's going to happen to ourselves. We know that deep down, but in our daily life, you don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I'm 35, my grandmother lived to 100, so I've got 65 years left. You don't think that way. You think, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to do this project. We don't live our lives thinking about death unless we're very, very close to it then things change. We do have this built-in survival mechanism to effectively deny death. But the idea of it happening to someone else, is that built-in stress reduction type thing? If you're not thinking about it all the time, won't there be lower levels of cortisol? Won't we be living a better life both mentally and physically if we're not constantly thinking about it? Absolutely. It does no good to brood about it. You have your life to live. If you spend all your time thinking about death, you're not going to live very much. I think it's probably a mechanism that has evolved. I don't know if people know what the underlying physiology is, but I found this one interesting report from psychologists who suggested that it is something that we've learned to suppress. And if we think about it, we think of it as more like happening to other people. That's just one report. But the reality is we just don't spend our lives brooding about it. Even though we have it in our subconscious, we're aware of it. We become aware of it probably between five and 10 years old. Children learn that their parents are going to die. Everybody they know is going to die. They themselves are going to die. So I think that realization sinks in and then it becomes just part of our subconscious. You go back in time and I would love for you to share perhaps your favorite anecdote or favorite story in terms of historical, but I can think of assorted research coming out these days. You bring up the Egyptian situation with King Tut. I can think of, I was just watching something today about the first Chinese emperor, and they're still trying to excavate his tomb. And I see these reports coming out of South America where they just found the other day a group of children that had been sacrificed. So the idea of death and dealing with death and perhaps trying to cheat death, this has been in the human condition for a very long time. Is there one particular historical anecdote or story that you like to share that really resonates with you? Well, the story that not just I, but almost everybody who has dealt with this topic shares is Qin, the emperor of China, who was so obsessed about dying that he would send emissaries to look for elixirs that would stave off death, and he would take all kinds of potions, which probably killed him off. People think that some of them were toxic and contained things like mercury. And then he also constructed this very elaborate tomb with this terracotta army. So he was hedging his bets in all ways. He was taking potions. He was sending emissaries to look for elixir. Some of them never came back because they thought if they came back without a magic potion, he would probably have them executed. And he died in, I think, in his 40s, early 40s. Maybe for his time, that wasn't so young, but he was an emperor. Perhaps he could have lived longer if he hadn't been so obsessed and taken all these weird potions. But I think that's a real lesson. Here's this guy who was on top of the world. He had basically conquered all his enemies, unified China, and yet he couldn't let go of this obsession with death. It's built into us. I guess it still strikes me as to the way that different people will look at it. I'd be amiss if I didn't do the deep dive though with you, because given your background, your experience, your education, why don't I let you take the floor and really start to explain why we die? The simple way that I take it from your work is it's when all the parts that seem to be working in unison, all those human parts, so to speak, are working in unison, and then they stop working in unison. And essentially, death is at that moment. Why don't I let you explain wider here? First of all, people need to define what death is. When you die, most of the cells in your body are still alive. So what do we mean by saying you died? You're exactly right. It's when all the component parts don't work as a unified whole. That's when you say, I'm no longer 
working as an individual. Yes, my heart might still work and could be given as an organ donation to somebody else. Same for various organs and all the bacteria in my gut. There are more of them than there are my cells. Those are still alive. What is it that dies? Ultimately, most countries define death as brain death, which is that the brain stops functioning. And the brain stops functioning because if the rest of the body stops functioning, let's say your heart stops functioning, that it doesn't get enough oxygen and nutrients to keep the neurons alive. Brain death is how we define death. Now, the question of why we die, biologists don't like the term why because it implies there's some underlying motivation or something. A biologist would say the reason we die is because we've evolved that way. And if we unpack that, then what it's saying is evolution doesn't care whether we live very long. It only cares that we live long enough to reproduce and make sure that our offspring survive so that our genes live on. What happens after that is almost irrelevant. There's no selective pressure for living long after you've had your offspring and raised them. This also explains why different species live different times. For example, if you're a species that is very subject to predators, there's no point in evolving to live very long because long before that, you'll be eaten by a predator. Your best bet is to mature very early, have lots of offspring early before you get killed off or die of starvation or something. There's almost this weird relationship between body size and lifespan, especially in mammals. The larger you are, on average, there are exceptions, and the exceptions are really quite interesting. But the larger you are, typically the longer you live. For example, whales or elephants live a long time. We're actually a bit of an outlier. We live much longer than our body mass would indicate. And that suggests that we've actually figured out how to increase our lifespan by improving health. That's the why about the evolution. The how we die has to do with what goes on inside our bodies that results in this process of aging, which precedes death. You can think of death as a result of aging. When aging reaches a certain point where things break down, that's when you can think of as death. I quote the famous line in my book from a Hemingway novel, which says, somebody's asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, two ways, first gradually, then suddenly. So the gradually is the aging part. The suddenly is when you reach a crisis and things stop working. That how has really the heart of the scientific chapters in the book. The middle section of the book is really all about what happens in terms of molecular biology. If we think of what is it that's controlling all the information in our cells and orchestrating things, one way to look at it is that DNA contains all our genes. It's the expression of these genes which make whole orchestra of proteins that have to work together. That's what's important. So if you damage DNA, then you make either defective products or you destroy the coordination in some way. So DNA damage, many people think, is a deep underlying cause. And there are lots of reasons for DNA damage. Our DNA is getting damaged all the time. And we've built in repair mechanisms to repair that DNA. Then you get to the thing that DNA codes for, which is this whole ensemble of proteins that makes a cell work. If those proteins become defective, they no longer work together. And in the worst case, they even, instead of just becoming non-functional, they even develop a bad function. For example, they can clump together and form aggregates. And these are thought to be involved, for example, in dementia, like Alzheimer's, where aberrant proteins come together to form tangles in our neurons. That's the next level. And you can think of changes to our DNA over time. So DNA gets modified using tags. And these modifications also result in aging. The modifications may be useful early on. They serve a purpose in helping cells differentiate into different types and control expression of genes. But later on, they cause problems and they're thought to be markers of aging. Another thing is 
our DNA is essentially a long linear polymer. We have 23 chromosomes, 23 pairs. What happens is that each time that DNA is copied, there's a problem at the ends, and the ends are called telomeres. And this telomere shortening is also thought to lead to aging of cells. So you can see where I'm going. There are levels, starting from the molecules that make up life to the cells that they exist in and to the communication between cells. For example, our immune system, which also suffers as we age. We have organelles in our cells, which are mitochondria. Mitochondria are particularly interesting because they're a result of a larger cell engulfing a smaller bacterium. So mitochondria are actually descendants of bacteria, but they've become part of us. So they may have started off as parasites, but we now couldn't live without mitochondria. But these mitochondria also suffer damage, and they suffer possibly more damage than the rest of the cell as we get older. This mitochondrial dysfunction is also a major cause of aging. What I'd like to conclude is that aging is not one thing. It's a lot of things that all affect each other. For example, DNA damage affects how mitochondria would work and possibly vice versa. The defects in proteins would also feed back to DNA repair. And these different types of biological processes are all interconnected. So there isn't some one target that you can say, oh, if I fix that, aging is solved. I think that's a, quite a naive idea. Clearly, you've done the deep dive. And if you were to get people into your thinking in terms of, because everyone wants to know, how do you slow the aging process if it's possible? And look, as a simple man, I would say to myself, well, if you try to lead somewhat of a healthy lifestyle, if you try to limit the intoxicants and all these types of things, if you avoid jumping off bridges and crazy stuff like that, that you might put yourself in a position to have better odds to get to that point of having a longer lifespan or perhaps slowing aging. How do you address that topic when people, they want to say, Professor, how do I slow my aging down? How do you bring them into your thinking? I lead off with what should have been the concluding remark, and that is there's age-old wisdom. And the wisdom is, don't be a glutton, okay? Eat moderately and eat healthily. And then another age-old advice is get exercise. Don't be overweight. Try to stay in shape. Get regular exercise. And the third is get enough sleep. This is something people often don't pay enough attention to, especially in our culture where we're expected to be switched on all the time. These three things... People said this without really understanding the molecular biology behind it, but it turns out that every one of those processes that I talked about has some connection with these three things. For example, two of my chapters are devoted to the whole problem of what's called nutrient sensing or caloric restriction. How does restricting your calories change the pathways in the cell, and how does that actually result in better aging or slowing down aging. It's the same with exercise. For example, one of the things exercise does is induces the growth of new mitochondria, which are these energy powerhouses in our cell. But it also has lots of other effects in terms of inducing repair mechanisms in our cells. And similarly, sleep is very intimately connected with repair mechanisms in the cell. I think there are a number of practical things we can do. Now, what the industry wants is two things. One is, we've known that gluttony is a bad thing, but it hasn't stopped us from indulging and overeating. America and the UK are at really bad places in obesity right now. Exactly. It's probably because we have not evolved to live in a time of plenty, of plentiful food. When we first became humans, food was not easy to come by. You were either hunter-gatherers or you had to manually to agriculture. It's hard work getting enough food to survive. We've not evolved where we can just go to some cafe and indulge in croissants or donuts at will. There is a disconnect between how we originally evolved and in our plentiful food supply. What I think the industry would like is some pill that you can take 
it doesn't matter then if you indulge because it's altering those pathways that you would alter by moderation or by restricting your food intake. I think that's what's driving some of the industry. When you say industry, you mean, for example, we will hear in the news every now and again about some Silicon Valley billionaire who is spending millions of dollars per year to supposedly retard the aging process. And there's a gleaming picture of him in a magazine or something like that. It's very odd, but the number of California tech billionaires interested, deeply interested in aging, is almost amusing. These middle-aged men are suddenly realizing they've got everything in the world. They can buy their own islands and fly in their private jets. But the one thing they can't do is stop that clock from ticking, okay? They're heavily investing in aging research. <laughs> and, and, and as a non-billionaire and not living in California either, I do find it slightly amusing, this whole trend. Why don't we keep it at that? Why don't we keep it at numbers for a second? This actually goes back to a question I wanted to ask earlier, because I know you've looked at the data, but in terms of lifespan, how can we imagine human lifespan over the centuries? Have we been at the max lifespan for a long time, at least the max as we know it, and perhaps men would often die because of wars and disease? And okay, there's less of that today, so perhaps we can say lifespan has increased, but has lifespan really increased? Where have we been across the spectrum going back in time? You have to distinguish between maximum lifespan and average lifespan. So average lifespan, no question, it's doubled in the last 100 years or so, or maybe 150 years. It's largely due to the first big increases came from reducing infant mortality. If you removed infectious diseases, or not removed, but minimized the risk of infectious diseases, improved sanitation, vaccination, all of those things allowed you to get through childhood without dying, those dangerous years when you're just born and when you're vulnerable. More recently, we've made tremendous strides in, for example, treatment of heart disease, treatment of diabetes, cancer. So we've also pushed things at the other end. The result is we've more than doubled our average lifespan, but maximum lifespan is a different thing. About 120, would that be roughly? 120 is the guess that most people have. The record holder, there are lots of spurious records, but the best confirmed record is this French woman, Jean Calmont, who lived to be 122. And nobody else has actually broken 120. That is, nobody whose records we're sure of has broken 120. So we think about 120 is the limit of our natural lifespan. And that's assuming we can live healthily and solve these things. But there are people who think that getting beyond 100 or 105, there's a lot of genetic components to it. So not everybody who lives healthily is going to live that long. One thing that you bring up in your work, and you talked about it earlier, but you talked about, okay, once offspring happen, that, okay, the parents might not survive. They might not live on. There might be a dangerous world out there, depending on the species. However, with humans in particular, it's quite interesting that women, when their childbearing years are over, I've given a couple examples in my own family on this conversation, but women can live on and men can too. But in particular, I think it strikes me with women that given menopause, it's not abnormal for women to go 30, 40, 50 years longer. Absolutely. And menopause is one of the, I still think it's a puzzle and there are lots of explanations for it. One early idea was what's called the good mother hypothesis. That is, your job is not done when you have menopause because you still have children and human children are vulnerable. So you have to stick around and raise them until they're independent. So that's another 20 years or 30 years after menopause. That's one thing. The other explanation is called the grandmother hypothesis, which says that actually women provide a useful role in the raising and protection of their grandchildren. That's why menopause exists. People argue that, well, in most of human history, people really did die either in childbirth or soon after menopause. They didn't live very long after menopause, most of them. And then they would argue, well, few people did survive, and those few people provided some collective wisdom for the community. But that involves group selection, which 
many evolutionary biologists, they just don't buy that genes work that way. Another possibility is that this increase in our lifespan has only happened recently. Women may have evolved to have a certain number of eggs, which lasted a certain amount of time, and we haven't had time to adapt to this increased lifespan. But ultimately, I think it's still a question that people debate about. Why do women live so much longer after menopause? Or why does menopause happen early, whichever way you want to look? If you had to look to any other species, other animals, and for us, homo sapiens, and it could be not as complex an organism, but if you had to look to other species where we could really take some insights and perhaps even, look, you've talked about exercise, diet, sleep, but other species that we might learn from, where did your research take you in terms of that direction? That's not my research, but there is a fascinating book called Methuselah Zoo by Stephen Ostad, and I discussed that book or rather his findings quite extensively in an early chapter on the variability of lifespan. And Stephen Ostad's view is that we should be looking at these outliers. Remember I talked about the relationship between body size and lifespan. If you plot that along a line, you can look for outliers, which are way off that line. And we're off that line, actually. But there are others that are off that line. And one of them is a bat. Bats live much longer than species that can't fly. And that makes sense because they can more easily avoid predators if you can fly than if you're, say, a terrestrially bound rodent. He suggests that we look for these. Now, some of these are a bird that Major Mitchell's cockatoo, which lives 80 years or something, exceptionally long for a small bird to live that long. There are uh, whales that live 200 years. There's a shark that lives 300 years. Now, some of these, this shark has very, very low metabolism. So the other thing is the faster your metabolism, the more likely you're going to die soon. There's an inverse relationship between metabolism and lifespan. If you have a very fast metabolism, you're effectively accumulating all the processes of aging at a faster rate. So you tend to die earlier. We could look at those species. Ultimately, though, my feeling is that we have to look at our species and our own biology. We can learn from other mammals because many of the processes are universal, but it's their rates and their relative proportions that are different in different species. We can learn from those species, but we ultimately have to think about our own biology and figure out what we could do, for example. Two things live more healthily for a longer fraction of our lives, which I have some doubts about because every time we increase our health, we also increase lifespan. Towards the end, we're not doing so well. But that's one of the goals of the aging research community is to have a long health span, which is a very large fraction of our life healthy and just a short fraction when we deteriorate before dying. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is, can we break this 120-year barrier, possibly by reversing some of the changes that happen with aging? And there are some indications we can do that. What's the deviation from, in your book, you talk about crackpots, profits, and stuff like that. And I'm not saying the Silicon Valley billionaires are that, maybe some are. But right now, where are we in terms of, okay, you got that 120 out there, and you might not necessarily be healthy to get to 120, but let's just say on the absolute number, 120, what can be imagined? What can you imagine? And when can you imagine it? The goal of the research community, by and large, is to increase health span. At least that's what they all say. I think deep down, many of them would like to extend life as well. Many of them, not all of them, but some fraction of them. There's a problem with that, which is if you're very healthy, and in my book, I talk about this poem called The Wonderful One Horse Shades by Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's about this one horse carriage, which is called a shay, that's built so that all the parts age at exactly the same rate. They're all perfectly made, so none of them breaks down before the other. This farmer is riding along, and the carriage is working perfectly well. And suddenly, in a second, he finds the whole thing is disintegrated, and he's on the ground in a heap of dust. Okay, That poem was quoted by the guy 
who coined this term called compression of morbidity. Morbidity is period of decrepitude and illnesses in our old age. And to compress it, meaning shorten that to a very short period in our lives. So most of our lives were perfectly healthy. This compression of morbidity is a dilemma because if you're perfectly healthy, why would suddenly things break down? There's no reason for it. If you have a car that's working perfectly well, why would it suddenly collapse? This compression of morbidity is a problem that hasn't actually been solved. I have some doubts about whether it's actually solvable because what is more likely to happen is you extend life by improving health, but eventually things will start to break down and then you will still have a prolonged period of disabilities of aging. But there is one striking piece of data that says that maybe it's possible. And that comes from the people who study centenarians, like your grandparents. And this one prominent researcher is Tom Burles, who's in Boston, who heads up the New England study of centenarians. And what he's found is that often, and it's especially true with what he calls semi and super centenarians. These are people who live to be 105 or 110. He says, what's remarkable about these people is that almost their entire lives, they've been healthy. They have a very, very short period when they're frail and debilitated before they die. It is at least these people are examples that you could have a very, very long, healthy life and compress that illness period to a very short time. That's one of the goals of the anti-aging research and anti-aging industry. The more far out goal is to say, well, we don't want to live, be bound by this 120 year limit that seems to be our natural limit. We want to see what we can do to get beyond that. That would involve actually reversing, not just slowing down, but reversing many of the process of aging. No progress there yet? Well, I was going to say there are glimpses in that direction, okay? Let me point out that we have actually reversed the aging clock throughout our history. And that is every time we create a new human being, okay? Every time a new human being is created, the aging clock in that individual is reset to zero, okay? I say in my book that a child born to a 40-year-old woman is not 20 years older than a child born to a 20-year-old woman. They're both at time zero. They're both starting at zero. We have figured out, at least in our own biology, how you could reset the clock. And cloning of animals, the first mammal to be cloned was Dolly the sheep who was very sick and died at about half the life expectancy of a sheep. People said, oh, this is because this was a cloned animal and you took an aged skin cell and then made it grow into a whole new sheep, so it started off old. But actually, there were lots of other sheep cloned by the same outfit at the same time. They all had D names, like, I forget them, Deborah and Daisy. Those animals lived completely normal lifespans, okay? Even though they started from a completely adult cell, which would have aged as it went from a baby sheep to an adult, they could somehow reverse it to produce a new animal. That was the first indication that you could perhaps reset this. And people think a lot of it has to do with wiping out these tags on our DNA that we accumulate as we get older. A scientist in Japan, Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for his work, along with John Gurdon, who did the first cloning experiment, he discovered that if you treated cells with these four factors, then the cell would go back in its development almost to the point where it had become like a fertilized egg. In other words, it's a cell that is called pluripotent, which means it could give rise to any tissue. Our original fertilized egg eventually develops into all of the different cells in our body, our skin, our bones, our blood cells, our brain cells. But as they specialize, they lose that ability. But what Yamanaka showed was that you could actually get these cells to go back to being what are called pluripotent stem cells, which could then be used to produce any other kind of cell. Now, there are problems with these Yamanaka factors. For example, three of the factors are what are called oncogenes. They're involved in turning cells into cancerous cells. 
And the early experiments with them produced a lot of tumors called teratomas. It's not clear how safe this is, but people have tried to transiently give these Yamanaka factors to mice. That is, they switch them on for a little bit and then figure out how to switch them off. And that has ended up somehow these mice appear rejuvenated. It has apparently reversed many of the symptoms of aging. This is called cellular reprogramming. There's a huge amount of interest in cellular reprogramming in terms of aging. Now, having said all that, it's very exciting fundamental research, but I think it's a long way before we can establish how to use it in humans and whether it's going to be safe and what the long-term consequences will be. But I feel that biology is advancing at such a rapid pace that it would be foolish of me to say, this is never possible. This is never going to be done. I just think it's complicated. We have no idea exactly how to go about it now, but that's not to say that it won't happen at some point in the future. You do go into the philosophical question of, should we live forever? Now, I'm sure myself, like anyone listening to this conversation, listening to you, I'm saying to myself, okay, he makes some great points about being healthy. I mean, no one wants to get to 120 if they've spent the last 40 years in bed. So if I can be healthy, then I'm asking you philosophically, if I can be healthy, why would I not want to live forever? What are some of the reasons? Give me some of your thinking. If you ask an individual that, nobody's going to want to die. We're programmed to want to live. That's just part of our biological makeup. Nobody voluntarily wants to die. My sister is a physician. She's an infectious disease specialist. And she was often called in for really horrible, complicated infections. For example, somebody had AIDS, but it had gone into their brain and they had all sorts of other bacterial infections going along with it. She said, it's striking. If you ask many of these people, do you want us to keep trying things or shall we just stop and give you some palliatives? Many of them would still say, no, no, I want you to keep trying. Even though they know they might only prolong their lives for a month or days even. If you ask individuals, then I don't think that's going to result in any different answer. Most of us want to live. The question is whether it's good for us as a society. There, the answer is not so clear. I think, for example, that a society where people just keep living forever is going to have a bunch of problems. Either you'll have overpopulation, which if we keep having children at the same rate, or we have to slow down our rate of reproducing to match our lifespan. So in other words, we still have to have only one or two kids. If we live for 200 years, we still have to have only one or two kids during our lifespan, so enough for replacement. And that means that we'll have a stagnant society. We'll have the same people living on forever. And people say, oh yeah, but I would have multiple careers and I would do different things. For the first 50 years, I would do one thing. For the next 50 years, if I was a scientist, they might just watch TV for the next 1,000 years. The problem is our creativity, et cetera, also depends on novelty. When we first grow up, as we're growing up, everything is new to us. And we view the world with new eyes and with open-mindedness. Most of us are very creative when we're young. I hate to say it because I'm 71, but that's just the reality. We wouldn't have that. If you look at all of the major social changes, whether it's women's rights or now rights for gays, others, all of those movements, civil rights, many of them were led by young people. They were people who saw the world with fresh eyes and said, hey, this is not right, and decided to fix it. I don't think if we live for hundreds of years, we'd become a stagnant society, and I think we might end up being bored. I think a lot of what's driving us is really that deep down knowledge that we don't like to talk about, but that the clock is ticking, that we have a limited time and we need to make the most of it. The pressure of time is at the root of creativity often. Exactly. These people who think, oh, it would be a great idea for everybody to live hundreds of years, I think it's nonsense, frankly. 
you go into a very interesting world on all facets. You dig deep. I have one last question to bring up, one last thought. And on this podcast years ago, I had a conversation with a professor, and he was speaking about, this is many years before the current AI rage, and he was speaking about how might be the way that we can get our consciousness from inside our skull to a hard drive. And then if our consciousness could exist on a hard drive, well, we've got virtual reality. How will we know the difference? And we can live happily ever after on the hard drive. <laughs> now, your laugh gives away my... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's complete misreading. of There is this whole field of cryonics where people freeze their brain. I will tell you, I talk in the book about how many really well-known, intelligent people have signed up for this thing, freezing your brain. Ted Williams, the baseball player. Well, that was almost involuntary. There was a fight between his kids. Two of them, I think, wanted his body frozen. But poor Ted's head is somewhere. <laughs> it is somewhere, <laughs> as far as I know. What this doesn't take into account is our brain is not just the connections between the neurons, but it's a state of the neurons themselves, which is responsible for what we're thinking at a particular time. And that state... It's very sensitive. If you deprive the brain of oxygen, you're going to damage a lot of neurons. And also extracting that state information after somebody's frozen, it's just crazy. You can quote me as saying, I think cryonics is completely, there's no evidence for it. I wasn't speaking about cryonics necessarily. I was just speaking about the idea. Maybe this is a little more going down the path of where Elon Musk talks about his Neuralink and stuff like that. Oh, I see. Oh, extracting the data from the brain, from the live brain. And having that exist on a hard drive so the consciousness could exist on a hard drive. No physical left. Without the... You're laughing again. <laughs> I would say that's squarely in the realm of science fiction at this point. Because we simply don't know in deep, that level of detail how the brain is organized. We don't even know what information we would need to extract from the brain in order to reconstruct a virtual brain. I think that's just not there. As I said about many of these other biological advances, things are moving at a tremendous pace and new tools are being developed even over the last 20 years to understand how the brain works as a circuit and how neurons are interconnected and so on. Maybe in 50 years, we'll know more about the brain and then we can think about whether this is even possible or not. But right now, it's firmly in the land of science fiction. But Jules Verne wrote about going to the moon and back. There you go. Look, you have dedicated your life to taking the deep dive on subjects that most of us just maybe scratch and sniff a little in high school. So I'm going to trust your wisdom at this point in time, because you've dedicated many, many decades to diving in. The book why We Die, The New Science of Aging and the Quest for Immortality. Again, people are going to have to check out your book. It's a wide cross-section of issues, and you do the deep dive. Vicky, I appreciate it. I hope you had fun today. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Is there a place you might like to send people? The book on Amazon, all that fun stuff. Is there a website? I was able to find you for scheduling purposes. <laughs> it's pretty easy. I have a website, but it's purely about my research on how the body makes proteins using this fascinating machine called the ribosome. But I don't have a website particularly dedicated to this book. But anybody who just Googles why we die with my name will find lots of sources, I'm sure. Again, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.